challenge that we, we face in pharmacy, or the challenges that indeed that we face in life, we have a choice over how we respond to them. And our experience over the last three years has very much shown us that different pharmacists choose to respond in different ways to CPD. Now, CPD and the requirements and the e-portfolio and e-portfolio review is the same for everybody. But the way in which we respond to it is different, and we can see that. And that's part of human nature. That's not anything specific to pharmacy. That yeah. is life and being human, that we all respond in very different ways. And we can respond from positivity, or we can respond from fear, or we can respond from different things. I'm not going to spend much more time talking about it because what I would like to do is um, introduce Declan Coyle. Um, he's from Andec Consulting, and his philosophy is that there's a green platform a green platform from where we can act out of positivity and embrace things that are happening to us. And ideally, as you go through this, con this conversation over the next hour, hour and a half, I'd like you to think about not only how does it relate to me, because everything starts with me, or how does it relate to the people that I work with, but how does it relate to pharmacy and the pharmacy journey, and how does it relate to CPD? So I know that's a lot to ask you to do, but if you can think about that, that would be great. I would love the Institute of Pharmacy, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, to be the green platform for pharmacy. It's apt with its colouring, and it could be the green platform for positivity and how we embrace the challenges um, that we have in the profession. So I'd like to introduce Declan, and uh, I will say no more than I have had the opportunity to talk to him briefly twice and to read his books, and he's made a huge impact on me already in terms of some of the philosophies that he has. So I'm sure you're going to really find this session enjoyable as well. So, Declan. Thank you very much, Katrina. Thank you. <coughs> I always feel at this stage, <coughs> could I go now <laughs> when I'm ahead? But uh, to start off with, County Cavan, very special place. I grew up there and Grew up in a lovely valley between Loch Crew and Loch Sheelan. And uh, we had a big farm, horses, cattle, sheep, pigs, all of that. And uh, like the, across the ditch was Meath. And in our tribe, every morning we'd go down, we'd thank God we're born in Cavan. Because just imagine across that ditch <laughs> was Meath. Any Meath people here? <laughs> but uh, we went to school in Meath. I think there's a Meath lady. <laughs> Cavan, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you understand it completely, because uh, Matty Kerrigan was asked one time, would he train the Cavan team, Matty is from Meath, and he said, oh sure, he said, no problem, get them through Ulster, I could get them through the semi-final, I can get them through the All-Ireland, he said, but there's no way I could guarantee I could get them through Kells, <laughs> so <laughs> that was, but growing up there, we had with all of that on the farm, but we had a lot of handed down scripts from the 12th century that were conditioned and were conditioned mainly to be miserable. And I'll, I'll, share, I'll, I'll explain why in a few minutes. But one day when I was 16, I read an article in the Columban Mission magazine called The Far East. And we had a tradition in Cavan of helping neighbours. If you help them with the hay, you help them with if there was a cow calf in your help, you helped everywhere out with neighbours. And I read about a Colombian missionary who had, had 40,000 people in a slum in Peru called El Monton. And I simply said, it was this simple, I said, sure, I'll go out and give him a hand and he'll only have 20,000. <laughs> so just have the burden. And joined the Colombians and got ordained 69, the same year as that epic match. And, um, it was December 69, and uh, instead of getting out to the Philippines or to the Latin America, I was sent to Ottawa to do postgraduate studies. After a few uh, years there, I was appointed to Boston to teach. And um, I wrote to the Superior General and said, look, I have nine years of post-secondary school study, and my problem is that I think I know it all. But if you give me five years in a slum, where the slum dwellers who've been to the University of Life and survived, and they teach me, and I get this in my blood and my guts <coughs> and my bones, then I'll teach anywhere. So <clears throat> instantly, I got a letter back. You're assigned to a slum <clears throat> in the Philippines for five years. Now, it was a horrific place. I remember in the, <clears throat> in the funeral book, 
counting the last 90 days uh, buried 65 children under two years old, all who died from hunger or hunger-related diseases in a world full of food. And I remember when I was <coughs> leaving, it, it was incredible because it, it was the, the big American base there, so I had 16,000 prostitutes in the parish. And you'd be with them at night and they'd have botched abortions from bamboo sticks and wire coat hangers. The next day you put them in the coffin, they'd be dead because they'd have gone, no antiseptic, they'd have gone into the sea, swimming in the sea, and of course, 3,000 sailors from the ship, the Enterprise, would, was all the toilets going into the sea. So out of that horror, we started pig projects, hen projects, fishing projects, grameen banks and all of that. But a Jesuit came and he did a Dennis Murphy from the Bronx and he did a debrief with me. And typical Jesuit, he built me up, told me about all the fantastic things I'd done. And I was purring like a cat. Do, 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 do. And then <clears throat> he flipped it and he said, after five years in Islam, are you a happier, more joyful, more creative person? Or are you more angry and bitter and resentful? I said, Dennis, were you listening to me? And justify is an awful verb. I said, I just told you I buried 65 children who died from hunger in a world full of food. Of course I'm more anger, angry and bitter and resentful. And then he said to me, if you're coming back to this slum, bring the people joy or bring them nothing. Because the last thing they need is another miserable, long-faced worker for justice and peace for them in their midst. He said, the end must be prefigured in the means. You must live the utopia. You come from an angry generation, he said, and an angry generation cannot bring peace to the world. He said, you must be a container for what you... You still don't get the Gandhi thing. Be the change you want to see in the world. Now that had a profound effect on me. And that brought me back to do my postgraduate studies to a, a visiting professor, an extraordinary man I was so privileged to meet there. His name was Viktor Frankl, an Austrian psychiatrist who was tortured in Auschwitz during the Second World War. And he told me they tortured me, they broke my body, they did operations on my genitals. But he said they couldn't touch my spirit. And he said every moment of every minute of every hour of every day in Auschwitz, I was happy because I chose to be happy. It was my choice. There he said I discovered the last and the greatest of the human freedoms, which is to choose your response in any given set of circumstances. So he said they could break my body, but they couldn't touch my spirit. And they killed 39 members of my family, but I still made the daily choice, fundamental choice to be happy, and I was happy every day. And he used <coughs> stuff I'd say to him, He'd say, I'd say, oh, he made me very angry. No, he said, he, he's jumping up like a wild horse gone man. You're freely choosing anger. That's your choice. And I didn't want to hear that. Because I remember the resentment. I didn't want to hear that because that meant I had to be responsible. I had to grow up. I had to get out of my comfort zone of blaming other people and other events and other situations. And I remember the only, I am responsible. No, he said, you have a choice. And then to say things like, oh, that one, she really annoys me. No, there you go again. You're making a very poor choice there. She does not annoy you. You're making a choice. Now, <clears throat> I'd never heard this. In Dungiman, where I grew up, people annoyed us. People made us angry. And he said, well, Declan, where is this coming from? Do you not understand? I said, you want to know where it's coming from? I'll tell you where it's coming from. <clears throat> when I grew up in Dungiman, there were six of us. There was five boys, one girl. And if we were messing in the room or something, my mother would come in and say, now stop that, carry on, you're making me very angry. It never occurred to me to say, excuse me, Mammy, but of all the choices you're making, that's one of the poorest. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so I was conditioned, as she was, as everyone in our tribe from the 12th century were, to think that people made us angry. I was conditioned to think that we were a bunch of predictable reflexes being triggered into predictable outcomes by people and events. That we had a choice? No, we, never, we, never, we were never told that. So education has to be education about the, the power to choose, the ability to choose. And we'll do a bit today about the subconscious because it controls 96% of the way we act and move and have our being. But one thing about the subconscious is it will not process negatives. So 
I'm going to ask you to do something now and please don't do it. Total disobedience. Are you ready? You're all going to do it because this is, this is low, low powered hypnosis. But don't do what I'm asking you to do. Are you ready? Don't anyone think of a white rabbit. <laughs> don't think of a polar bear in Alaska. Not a red polar bear, not a blue polar bear, and definitely not a little fluffy pink one running in a Kilkenny jersey. <laughs> Because, and you see, the subconscious won't process not don't instead of or without. It just between the picture and the emotion connect with the picture. So a mother will say to a child, be careful, don't drop that. And the child drop, oh, I see it coming. I knew it was going to happen. You don't listen to me. The problem is the child listened. Don't bang that door to a child means what? <laughs> bang that door. So if a child is climbing out on a tree, on the, on the branch of a tree, what do you see? No, not don't fall or he's gone. You see hold on tight, where attention goes, energy flows, and we must always put attention to what we want, not what we don't want. And that's our challenge today. We do two things all day, we think and we feel. That's all we do every day. We think and we feel. Now my question is, why are you thinking and feeling about what you don't want to create and attract in your life on the negative red platform, when you can think and feel about what you do want to create and attract into your life on the green platform? And it's that simple. So it's when you see that it won't process negatives, and what were our, <clears throat> I mentioned, we gave each other auto-suggestions to be miserable in our tribe in Dungiman. Because we had a disease, and I was a carrier of that disease for years. The disease is called not-so-badism. Like, how are you doing? Not so bad. Bad. Like, the subconscious won't process not. How are you doing? Can't complain. Complain. Hanging in there. Surviving. Keeping head over the water. Paying the bills. Keep the wolf from the door. And like a one in clear a few years ago, or two steps ahead of the hairs. And then you wonder why we're having bad days. And I got an old man down in Bray a few months ago. He's 87. And I said, like, how are you make? And he went on and he said, Asha, the maggots are winking up at me now. <laughs> And there was another one up in Oma, how are you doing? And it was us sitting up and eating a bit, the hospital bed one. But everything is negative. And we give each other these sorts of suggestions. So the man down in Cork and he said, I went up the West, he says, that drove them crazy, I went countercultural. What do you mean you, what do you, mean you went countercultural, went all positive? You went all positive. Psychosomatically, he said, I discovered you cannot say great and feel bad. So they asked me, how are you doing? I said, great. I was almost physically attacked. Great the head of him. We're, going to, we're not going to put up with that. We're not going to... Do you know when you're miserable and you see somebody who's happy? Like, you're not going to have too much of that around here. Like, you're going to get them into your misery, part two. But that was growing up in Dungiman. And um, then it was years later reflecting... You see, I used to be against positive thinking because I thought it was an American aberration. I thought in America they're all positive, but they're not real. In Ireland we're all, uh, we're all negative, but we're real. And it was like one time when Carl was asked on the Late Late Show, way back from all smoking, he, so he said, Gayborn asked him, what's the difference in America and Ireland? Well, he said, in America they're not sincere, in Ireland we're very sincere. And Gay said, no, you can't make a sweeping statement like that. He said, give me an example. Well, he said, you go to the checkout in the Walmart in the United States and say, and she says, no eye contact, no smile, just have a nice day, have a nice day, have a nice day. You know she's not sincere. But you go into Dublin, into a cafe in Dublin, and you look for a cup of coffee. There's a lady sitting up in a high chair, and she's handing a cup of tea and a cigarette. And you say, excuse me, could I have a cup of tea, please? And she turns and says, feck off, can you see him on my break? <laughs> and he said, you know she's so sincere. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, my problem with positive thinking was, if I had a trauma, an emotion, if my, say, one or two of my three children were killed, and it's like a sidewinder missile hits you here, puts your guts up against the wall, and then you come up to me and you say, oh, you've got to have a PMA, you've got to have a positive mental attitude, you know, you've got to get on the green platform, I'll give you a PMA on the green platform, because that's not emotionally honest. So the first step is that you feel the feeling fully. If it's tragedy, you cry the tears. Loneliness, you turn on the tap. If it's love, you love fully. Whatever it is, you're emotionally honest. And then we have the white space. Between stimulus and response, there is a space, that white space. And in that, we have the last and the greatest of the human freedoms. 
in that white space, in that millisecond, we can choose. I can choose my response, I can choose a red platform. I took the colours from one day at lights, red for stop subliminally, green for go. And the red platform is the, is the victim, the whinge, the whine, the moan, the poor me. And underneath that platform is a septic tank of sabotage called fear. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And on that platform there's the ego, and the ego is the false self. And the ego has one agenda, and that's to keep you from your happiness now. It does that very subtly by getting into the past with shame or guilt or regret, or the future with fear, anxiety or worry. But like a shadow cannot live in sunshine, the ego cannot live in the now. So to be fully present and aware in the now, and the ego's favourite sentence is, you're not enough. You're not fit enough, you're not thin enough, you're not uh, rich enough, you're not secure enough, and you go to bed at night, says you didn't get enough done, you get up in the morning, you didn't get enough sleep, nothing is enough for the ego. And I remember Genevieve, when she was 16, she showed me her daughter, this anorexic model on the front of a, a magazine, and she said, Daddy, I want to look like her. I said, Genevieve, not even she looks like her. And it's that other thing that the ego will say you're not enough. And then, when you do become aware, and you know, I'm fully present here now, and I'm happy now, the ego is sitting here, and it's the, the whispers in here, yeah, but how long, around here, how long is that going to last? So it'll get you out of the present moment. So the art is to be fully present, and then, like a shadow cannot live in sunshine, the ego cannot live with your awareness of the now, of being present in the now. Back to our white space, we can choose a green platform. The green platform has the ten most powerful words in the English language, no word more than two letters. If it is to be, it is up to me. And every moment of every minute, of every hour, of every day, we can make that choice. We make a fundamental green platform choice in the morning. One man says, I get out of the shower, I have a green mat outside, I step on it. The shower is washed away all the negativity. He says, I wake up and my head is invaded by a posse of negative thoughts. Then I step on that and today is going to be a good day and I commit to live on that green platform today. The green platform is find where we find creativity, where we're innovative, where we, underneath the green platform is the field of all possibility. Underneath the red platform is that septic tank of sabotage called fear. On the green platform, we choose actions that bring joy to others. We have fun, we're creative, we're innovative, we make things happen. And on the red platform, life is happening to us. On the green platform, we are happening to life. And we have stories. On the red platform, we have poison stories. And poison stories are something happens and an event has no meaning, a situation has no meaning, an email has no meaning, or a, a fact has no meaning, unless I make up a story in my head about it. So it's my story that matters. And we're not aware that we're making stories up all the time. I look out the window in the morning and say, oh my God, that's a dreadful day. Of course it's not a dreadful day. The day has its own energy. As Billy Connolly said, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just inappropriate clothing. And but we, we start that story. It's not a, a bad day. It's a toxic, bad, negative story in my head. So something happens, storytelling time. I come back on the red platform and I say, this is a disaster. But I can equally move over to the green platform and I say, no, it's a great opportunity. I can go on the red pl platform and I can say, woe is me. Or I can go to the green platform and say, I can handle it. And it's my story. Now, my question to people is, why are you making up a story on the red platform that makes you feel bad when you can make up a story on the green platform that will make you feel good? Now, neither story will change the reality, but the positive story will change you. And an interesting thing we do in the workshops is we get people to go back to a negative event in their life where they told a negative story and Go back to what would it be if you told a positive story? And uh, just give an example. A certain um, hurling team that should remain nameless. I was doing a little bit of debriefing on them. And with them, and <coughs> a certain other team had given them a very bad beating and scored three goals and all the rest of it. And the question they had was, what was your story? Because your energy follows your story. So I said to one man, 
After the first goal, how are you? My story was fine. Second goal, my story was fine. Third goal, then he mentioned the name of a carpenter poet of Galilee, and he said, now we're totally banjaxed, except he didn't use the verb banjaxed. <laughs> and uh, I said, now, where did your energy go after that? Well, he saw I was banjaxing useful. Useless, he said. OK. Now, go back to that moment. Third goal goes in. What would be a positive story you could have told in that millisecond? Well, he said, you're always telling us the players like dynamite, all the powers on the inside. All we need is somebody to ignite that explosion. I could have said the third goal has ignited my dynamite. I'm going to go to war. I'm going to relish the battle. I'm going to play with freedom. I'm going to play with abandon. And I'm going to inspire everyone around me. But he said, sure, I did. But he says, I didn't say that. But I said, you can from now on. And he later on won an All Ireland medal that year and an All Star. And he said to me one time, he said, I didn't win the All Star, the night of the All Stars. I won it the night, the day I changed my stories. Changing from being negative into positive. Then we have questions, red platform. We have poison questions. And it's 100% certain if I ask a poison <coughs> question, you get a poison answer. Green platform, power questions. And it's 100% certain if I ask a power question, you get a power answer. So what are poison questions? Poison questions, why me? What else is going to go wrong? What did I do to deserve this? Why do these things always have to happen to me? Power que poison questions, 100% certain you get a poison answer. Why me? What else is going to go wrong? Why you? Why you? Because you're a slob. Because you lacked early life love. Because your mother loved your sister more than you. But I didn't have a sister, but if you had, you would have. <laughs> so we're going to get a poison answer to a poison story. Ask power questions. How can I, what can I? How can I turn this around and enjoy the process? How can we have more fun around here? How can we double our productivity and have our time? How can I be the very best version of myself so that those around me can flourish and shine and be the best that they can be? How can I fuel every moment with the best that's in me now? How can I take today and make it happen and create it and <clears throat> make, make it the best possible day for the staff and the customers and everybody around? And then we have beliefs, red platform beliefs, I can't. And if you believe you can't, you have a septic tank of sabotage helping that process. If you believe you can't, green platform, you believe you can. You can also make it happen on the green platform. You can bend reality. The world is full of possibility, but we get locked in. You see, we get locked in with our education to tell me what to do and I'll do it. But never, here's a dream. How would you go about that? And don't worry, if you have a what and you have a powerful why, 80% of the energy to achieve any goal comes out of your why. Then you create, you'll invent the how. You just go for what you want. So that would be a quick look at Green and Red Platform because I'm always conscious of getting the basics across first in case this clock might catch up with this. But um, in, in this book, uh, Positive Intelligence, we see that 80%, like we all, most of us achieve our potential 20%. And today is, what about that 80%? Most teams and individuals peak at 20%. We have 80% untapped. So let's look at that 80% and see what else could we do to make that happen. Now for the heavy philosophical stuff. What's the purpose of life? <laughs> the purpose of life is very simple. It's to be happy. Why do we do anything we do? Uh, Sonia, you're married. You met your beloved somewhere. When you decided to marry him, was it in the back of your mind, I'd be happy, <laughs> you know? It was happiness. You had your child. When the child arrived, was it happiness to be happy? Now, we do everything we do in life to be happy. Whatever it is, if we could get this thing sorted out, it would be happy. And the only way that I know to be happy in this life is to make somebody else's life a bit better. Because we do studies around the world and we get the patterns. You ask people, break up the twos and threes, Give me three situations where you're at your, most, at your happiest, three situations where you're at your most miserable. When people were at their happiest, it was all about you. You, you, you is the sole song of joy.
when people are the most miserable, it was all about me. Me, 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 poor me, look what they're doing to me. Aren't they awful? <laughs> and that pity party, that, and that's just when people are at their most miserable. And again, it's to reinforce what is positive in the world. So any of you have customers, internal customers, staff, well, first thing here, this is where it all goes downhill, Katrina, because ask not what your customers need. And ask not what your internal staff need. And you've got families, ask not what they need. Partners, husbands, wives, these people, above all, ask not what they need. But rather, wrong questions. Rather ask, what is it that brings you fully alive? Because you fully alive is what your customers need, is what your staff need, is what your families need, is what your, your partners need. What is it that brings you fully alive? When you die and go to heaven, before you meet St. Peter, there's the blue and white room, which is the cavern room. There's a replica here. And the cavern gods are up there. And the cavern gods will say two questions they'll ask you. And it was interesting because that was the answer that Morgan Freeman gave to Jack Nicholson in the book list. He asked him, like, two questions. Did you, fi Did you find joy in your life? And number one. Number two, did your, did your life bring joy to others? They're the only, at the end of your life, at the end of your day, the only two questions that really matter. Do you find joy in your life? Do your life bring joy to others? You know, not today, but out here in three weeks' time when I get things sorted, then I'll have joy. It doesn't work that way because we got, we got happiness and success totally backwards and bankrupt. We thought, if I do this, the, 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 get all this other stuff started, coming down, and then I'll be happy. You know, it doesn't work like that. Because as soon as they get that, we push out the cognitive barriers. I'm first going to run around and say, oh, God, if I can meet a young woman, get married, beautiful young woman, fall in love, get married, fall in love. Then push out again, if we could have children, oh, my God, you get the children. And then um, you have to the say, oh, my God, if we only get them out of nappies. And then you say, if we only get them, that they, could, uh, like, they, that they wouldn't be in the car seat. Or they, they could walk, oh, my God, if they could walk. Then into a kindergarten, or a decent kindergarten. Then into a good primary school. Then the secondary school. Oh, it's very expensive, but it should give them a bit of confidence. Get them into secondary school, then university, and then get them a good job. Then with a 34, if I only get them out of the house. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we keep pushing happiness out. Now, the key is, is to be happy here now. Professor Sean Acker in, in Harvard has done a, a, a lovely study on that, and um, he has, I'll show you the five steps to be happy here now. It's about not postponing happiness. It's not because it's all that destination. And it's like the farmer who found this eagle's egg, found the eagle's egg and put it under a hen. The hen hatched out the eagle. And the eagle grew up and thought she was a hen and scratched around. The one day she saw this eagle flying in the sky and said, that's living, that's life. I'd love to be up there soaring through the sky. But the other hens convinced her. Go out of that. You're a hen, you're born a hen, you live a hen, you'll die a hen. Now, she went to a lot of very good hen scratching seminars <laughs> and a green platform workshop on uh, being happy. Come on, hen, uh, eagle, the you you see is the you you'll be, you're a hen. But she lived, she never connected to her purpose. She never did what made her heart sing and she died with her music still in her. So again, Japanese language time now. So Torai is a moment of enlightenment. And I had a few in my life. One moment of enlightenment was here in this famous gorge in Taiwan. And uh, it's Taroka Gorge. It takes five and a half hours to walk it. And three of us, a New Zealander, a European and myself, we decided we'd walk in five hours because we were, we were going to knock a half an hour off this. So we doing a very fast pace up the gorge. And then here in the corner were 10 little Chinese Buddhist nuns, hair shaven like 10 little Sinead O'Connors. And one of them came up and she said to me, Excuse me, she said, but you're missing the gorge. And I said, but I'm in the gorge. The gorge is here, the gorge is there, the gorge is everywhere. How could we be missing the gorge? She said, from the moment I saw you in the distance, there's little dots coming along the gorge. I knew you had to be from the west because you're missing the gorge. Then she said, Zosha, sit down. I sat down. Then she said, thingy, thing, gender thing. Listen, really listen. I listened, I heard nothing. But then gradually I heard it. The gurgling, the water and the, and the rocks, the insects, the 
tropic birds camouflage in the trees, the breeze coming through the trees and the foliage. Suddenly there was a whole cacophony of sounds coming out of the gorge that I hadn't heard. Then she said, Shinsai Kani Kan Jenda Kan. Now look and see, really see. And it looks so the blues, the greens, the purples, the violets. And the blue dome over it all. And then she said, Sunset Chidani you go. Now three times breathe in deep the gorge. And after the pollution of Taipei to get this fresh air on the east coast of Taiwan, it was fantastic. Then she turned a little porcelain chin up to me and she said, See, you are missing the gorge. And I looked ahead and I saw what the others had gone on ahead, and I knew I was going to have to run to catch them. And then she hit me in the solar plexus with the next sentence. She said, I hope this is not a symbol of your life. And I said, you can sing it, baby, it's a symbol of my life. Because missing the gorge, destination addiction, was what my life was about at the time. And the mountain of success is going to be very lonely if we don't enjoy the climb, the view, and the companionship on the way up. And it's how many of us are into destination addiction. And I swear to God, we didn't cooperate on those slides. <laughs> you had the journey and the whole thing of not missing the destination. It's to be fully present here now. Of course we need a destination here. But you have your destination, then you detach from it, and you put all your energy into the present moment. Because the now is the only place we're ever going to live in our lives. We're never going to live in the not now. But the ego will do everything. It's later on is the real thing. This evening, Friday evening, what time will you get home at? It's the traffic. Will we get out in time? It's all of that. Two questions. Where are you here? What time is it now? And then in every moment, we have the choice between fear and freedom. So it's to be here now. And yesterday's history, tomorrow's mystery. Today is a gift. And that's why we call it the present. Lao Tzu said, when you're depressed, you're living in the past. When you're anxious, you're living in the future. But when you're at peace, you're living in the present. So it's getting that peace. Now, some years ago, this story of the gorge was told. I told it all over the world, but a man, uh, Colin Shaw, heard it, and he wrote a book called Revolutionize Your Customer Care. And he asked me, could he use it in his first chapter? Because he said, the gorge is our customer. Most of the time, we're missing our customers. So he called the first chapter, Are You Missing the Gorge? But then I decided I wasn't going to tell the story anymore because in this work, you either live it or you don't. You cannot talk about the green platform if you're living on the red platform. You have to may at least be seen to be trying to do it. So I was missing the gorge at home three to five minutes, maybe twice or three times a day. And that is because we have a special needs child at home, our third child, Alexander. He's 12. He has Maud Wilson syndrome, which means he'll never talk. He won't walk until he's about 14. He's taken a few steps now. He hasn't eaten for the last 10 years. We've hit him through a tube, through his stomach. He's peg fed. He's doubly incontinent. He'll be nappies the rest of his life. He has multiple allergies. He has, he's on 31 medication, syringes of medication every day. He was four months from the 2011, four months 2012. And um, he, um, a, he was 10, 11 days in intensive care where we, the doctors had given up on him, but he bounced back from that. Having said that, he's the most magical child. Now, but he's big now, he's 12, and um, here he is. But when I'd be changing his nappy, like he'd be, and I'd be he'd have, with, the, with the antibiotics, he'd be poo up to his neck and poo down his neck. And they would try and change him, and, and the other kids would be, I might say, just wait, don't talk, just give me three to five minutes and I'll get this done. Then Hugh, our neighbour, might come in and he'd say, oh, I heard him screaming, you were changing the nappy. So then I decided, OK, I'm missing three to five minutes changing the nappy time. I'm missing the journey, Katrina. So I said, I'm going to bring joy from deep within me to changing this nappy, or else I'm never telling the story of the gorge again. So then I started with a leg up here and a leg down there. Oh, that's the biggest poo I've ever seen, the biggest poo there's ever been. I've never seen a poo like that poo I saw in the poo maker's poo shop. And he would go into stitches with the lab and a leg up, this down, down the hand, oh, wouldn't put the hand down there, because you put the hand down there, oh no, keep that hand up there. And Hugh came in sometime afterwards, he said, I heard he was laughing and you were changing his nappy. How did he change? I said, Hugh, he didn't change. I changed. Does that make sense? You can bring joy from deep within you to whatever you're doing. Now, Annette, my wife, from Australia, the thing is, 
she would do this automatically, no crying, I wouldn't talk about it. But I'm a man. <laughs> and I have to, I changed his nappy. Ooh, you know. <laughs> Everybody knows about it when I changed nappy because somebody said to me the other day, like, you know, when a woman is at her deepest, most horrific pain in the midst of childbirth, it barely approaches what happens to a man when he gets a dose of a cold. So <laughs> anyway, that's the man and woman. So that's Satara, Satori number one. Moment of enlightenment number two was meeting this man I told you, Victor Franklin. He wrote this beautiful book called Man's Search for Meaning. And this is actually him here in Auschwitz, in that place. And he said, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that, we have the power to choose. And in that leaves our growth and our freedom and our happiness. That ability to choose. So there is a space to react or to choose your response. And it's getting into that. So you have an event. It, it is as it is. We cannot argue with reality or you'll lose, but only 100% of the time. Now, a few years ago, I'm in mean, Chicago, going down to Lexington, quarter to five flight, delayed, quarter to six, quarter to seven, quarter to eight, quarter to nine. This man stood up, the rope stood in his neck with rage. And he screamed and he shouted, he cursed, went up to the lady behind the desk, he banged the desk and he cursed and screamed and shouted. And then he came back down and he saw me sitting in my place of inner peace on the green platform. And you know when you're really mad and somebody is like that, you know, and he says, what are you so happy about? <laughs> you know, I said, well, it is as it is. But he said, it shouldn't be as this. I have a very important meeting to go. It's not the first time. And he went on. I said, look, anytime you argue with reality, you'll lose, but only 100% of the time. And he says, what are you talking about? He says, I said, look, it is as it is. I said, it is as it is, but it shouldn't be as it is. I said, have you a cat at home? He said, cat, cat, a cat, I have a cat. What's a cat got to do with it? Well, I said, tomorrow morning, I said, go and spend three hours teaching your cat to bark. At the end of three hours, your cat's going to say, meow, <laughs> because your cat's a cat. It is what it is. Are you worse than she is? And he turned off. <laughs> Ten minutes later, he was carried out in a stretcher. He'd given himself some kind of heart attack or palpitations or something. So I went up to the lady behind the desk. He said, yes, what is it? Be quick. I just I said, look, I want to say, yes, what is it? I said, I just want to say, that it doesn't matter what happens around here tonight, this evening. Don't let anything disconnect you from your inner peace and joy. <laughs> 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 and she went, like, she was like Dustin Hoffman when he saw Mrs. Robinson naked and the graduate. He just, it's a squeak. Uh, she just squeaked. Uh, uh. So it is as it is. But it is as it is alone can be a difference or apathy. Three weeks ago in Mankato, this lady came up to me in the States and she said, for the first time I understand it is as it is because I would tell something a problem to my boss and he might say, but it is as it is. But that was an excuse to do nothing. But the, the formula in the green platform is acceptance, that's number one, plus pan, plus positive action now, and the third step is the whole universe will conspire with you. So it is as it is, and then we take positive action. So it is as it is, you have a human experience, you feel it, if it's tragedy, you try the tears, you honour your human experience. There's no healing without a real feeling. And then we have our choice. I can choose the red platform, the disempowered, the victim, the blame, the complain, the whinge, the whine, the moan, the poor me. Or I can choose a green platform with the 10 most powerful words in the English language. If it is to be, it is up to me. If I choose the red platform, I'm choosing fear, self-doubt, procrastination, helplessness, bullying, toxic stress. But if I choose the green platform, I'm choosing peace, I'm totally responsible, I'm positive, I'm innovative, I'm creative, I have integrity, I live with passion, I have trust, I have fun, we're joyful. Underneath the green platform is the field of all possibility. I'm a go-giver, not just a go-getter. I choose actions that bring joy to others. I go with the flow of life. I'm one with life. And... Uh, I love this morning the way Katrina went with the flow of life. Her son wanted a response, she gave it to him. And everything was fine. We didn't implode here. She came back in and it, and it worked. And even the timing, you got an extra gift there of time, Katrina. So it all worked out. You have an intention, put a conviction in that, you manifest in reality. Each one of us have a unique talent to be used in the service of others. And the unique talent is that when I was years ago or a few years ago when I was writing just here the, the book The Green Platform 
Uh, the opening line I took from Paulo Coelho, everyone on the earth, on the face of the earth, has a treasure that lies waiting for them. And that has always fascinated me, that hidden treasure in people. And um, it's, you know, I got nine years post-secondary school study, but I never got an education. Because education is asking and answer two questions, and two questions only. One is, what's your gift, what's your talent, what's your signature strength? Second question, how are you going to use that in the service of humanity to build a better world? Education, aid dukery, to lead out, to draw out from within, to draw out the gift from within. Now I got ed stuffed in nation, but never got education. No teacher, no professor ever sat down with me and said, Declan, this is our education time. <clears throat> what's your gift? What's your talent? What's your signature strength? Now let's see how we can use it in the service of humanity to build a better world. And because we don't have education in our schools or in our universities, we end up with Mozart milking cows, Michelangelo minding sheep, and highly skilled carpenters as frustrated surgeons here in Dublin. Because it's what's the gift, it's not about the points, it's not about all of that, it's what's your talent. And that goes, when we go around the corporate world, we ask people, how are we the company using your talent, your unique skills? 83% said, no, you're not. So we have middle managers and they spend a huge amount of their time teaching hens to swim. They work hard at the, teaching the hen to swim in the morning, still the hen is no good at swimming. Then they, 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 they're committed, so they build a hen gym in the afternoon. They have the hen doing all kinds of exercises, swimming exercises, all the rest, still the hen is no good. Then get a personal trainer in, come on, work with the hen, 11, 12, do that other stretch, still the hen is no good. Then do 360 degree feedback, you're okay at laying the old eggs, but your swimming is atrocious, you have to improve your swimming. The hen goes out depressed, the manager's depressed, then the guy find this man who wrote the book called The Green Platform, or get him, he works with the hen for two days, come on hen, if it is to be, it's up to me, you're on the green platform. Still the hen can't swim, get rid of him and his book. Then one day, then one fine day, we discover a duck, and a duck swims. Swimming is a duck's job, <laughs> laying eggs is a hen's job. But because we don't get the education, we're not drilling to people, what's your unique talent? What's, what, what is it, what's the gift that you have that the, that the world out there needs? But we get, we get everything stuffed in. And if we're to follow the, the education, when I was in school, if you're talking to the person beside you, stand out against that wall. In the corporate world, if you're not talking to the person beside you about how you can come up with a solution, then you're out against the wall. It's a totally, we're totally lacking in that reason. So the, the treasure, at the end of then after 30 chapters of wrote, if you live on the green platform, you'll find the treasure that lies waiting. But if you're really alert and aware and awake, the treasure will find you. People are conscientious. On their, we have 90% of how we react to people. We have a real power. It's where we find real love and uh, it's where we find our treasure. Red platform, we're into compliance. Green platform, we're into genuine engagement. How does it work practically? That anyone ever says something mean to you and without the white space, you shh, like you shot through the white space and you react and say something mean back. You know, your intention is good because you want to give them a bit of their dose of their own medicine and you want to give them a little bit extra so they really know what it felt like. Have you ever done that where even once it helped the situation or the relationship? But if you can take your time and choose the response, choose the energy with which you respond, don't bite that hook, but choose the energy, choose kindness, choose understanding, choose compassion. And just make that choice to pause for a little breath and make the choice not to react. Now, even though Viktor Frankl told me all this way back in the 70s, it's one thing knowing what to do. It's a hugely different thing doing what we know. Like, we all know what's good for us. You know, you get up at 6 o'clock, 5.30 this morning, you go for a run or a jog for half an hour, come back in, do 50 minutes Pilates or yoga, and then 50 minutes meditation, and then a little sit-down breakfast where you squeeze orange juice and everything is nice and natural. You're going to feel great for the day. We all know that. That's why probably everyone here this morning did it. So it's not knowing what to do, it's doing what we know. So I knew about the choice. But Genevieve, our oldest daughter, she's 23, she's finishing nursing in England now at the moment. But when she was four, uh, I was putting, um, I was putting eggs in the fridge. And she said, um, Daddy, she said, 
she said, I want to help put the eggs in the fridge. Now, wheel back to Victor Frankl. I'm not responsible for other people's actions, but I'm totally responsible for my reactions. So I said, no, Genevieve, they're very delicate, they're very fragile. No, Daddy, please, 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 I want to help you. No, Genevieve, they're very fragile, very delicate. Please, Daddy, please. I said, okay, well, be careful. I said, don't drop them. So on cue, what did she do? <laughs> drop the two of them. And I was about to react and give the same response that every generation of our family gave to children who dropped eggs. From we dropped eggs in the cave floors in Loch Crewe when we were cave men and cave women thousands of years ago. At the last second, I saw white space. So a little green platform the size of a poster stamp. And I said, Genevieve, I said, isn't that a very interesting design on the floor? Do you think she would take a picture of that and show it to Mammy? And she was stunned that an adult didn't react but had chosen a response. So she caught my knee and the little face looked up and she said, Daddy, I love you. Because the consequences of making these choices are enormous. Not reacting, just pausing, making that choice. Getting rid of them, you're really annoying me. No. You're doing what you're doing. I'm making a terribly poor choice here to be annoyed. And I have, I'm in the driving seat. So it's the E plus R. The event or the situation plus your response, choice of platform, equals your outcome result, equals your quality of life. And it's that simple. Whatever is happening, wherever is happening. And the greatest wealth you can have in this world is the ability to manage your inner state. Look at Elvis Presley, look at John Bellucci, look at Marilyn Monroe, look at Michael Jackson, George Michael, Prince. They had huge, great financial wealth, but didn't have the greatest wealth, the ability to manage their inner state, without drugs, without a, a shooting up with all this stuff. So how you feel profoundly affects how you perform at work. And how do you feel when you're at your best? Now this is from a survey around the world. When you're at your best, you're energised but calm. Isn't that a nice combination? Energised but calm, you're enthusiastic, confident, optimistic and passionate. Now, do you want to go in and work with a green platform staff who are energised but calm, enthusiastic, confident, optimistic and passionate? Or do you want to work with a red platform staff? It's an entirely different world to live in. And when I ask people, you know, what's your two biggest problems? It's stress and fatigue. They're the two big ones, stress and fatigue. And we can create another world where we don't have these things. Now, is there a way that we can change our brain, change the inner landscape of the brain to be positive? Again, Professor Sean Archer, Harvard, do five things for 21 days and you will actually change the inner landscape of your brain because of the brain's plasticity. We know now that the brain isn't set. We can, it can change. So for 21 days, you say, what are three things you're grateful for? Just very simple because this is about the lens of the brain. The lens of the brain is scanning every night. The usual scan it does is the 9 o'clock news. And what's that? Is it the 9 o'clock positivity or could you call it 9 o'clock negativity? I remember saying to the editor of a newspaper one, why are all your stories so negative? And he said, look, son, if it bleeds, it leads. So it's to switch that into three things you're grateful for because gratitude and negativity cannot coexist. Second is a journal and you write down one positive thing. Now, once, you, if, once your brain starts, is activated, you cannot come up instantly with one positive thing. You think about 10 positive things and then you pick the one. I might end up with Alexander's smile. Then exercise, 20 minutes to a half an hour every day. And then meditation. Because the stud Harvard study said most Americans are living what they called cultural ADHD. Shallow breathing. <laughs> but to breathe deeply, breathe slowly and follow the breath. Push your tummy out like a baby. Any thought, gently put it aside. Any feeling, gently put it And back to the breath. Focus on the breath and breathe it deeply. Breathe slowly and follow the breath and calm the mind. Just let all that nonsense, just let it flow through. Don't fight it. Put it aside and back to the breath. And five minutes of that is the equivalent of about two hours sleep in terms of renewal. And then an act of kindness, because when they put all the electrodes and measure people, the person who received the act of kindness got a rush of all the positive happy chemicals, like the dopamine, the good endorphins, and the serotonin. And uh, same thing happened to the person doing the act of kindness when they uh, wired them up. 
but even somebody observing an act of kindness had a similar response. So do that for 21 days and you're going to have a totally different, you rewire your brain. Because the way we are, once we're complaining, we're going down neurocortical pathways here, chuk, 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 and I strengthen that, that all these synapses start linking together like a plaque, chuk, chuk, quicker, quicker. So I come out and there's something really, it's a lovely, nice day. I go straight down the complaining pathway because that's what my brain is used to. John O'Donoghue who was saying one day, it was a beautiful day in the burn, and he met this lady, Mary, and he said, Mary, isn't that a beautiful day? Bees were buzzing, lovely breeze coming in, butterflies flying. She says, yeah, but what will it be like tomorrow? She was determined not to live because the pathway was built. You build the other pathway, and the pathway of gratitude, you'll strengthen that neurocortical pathway, and it'll make it totally, totally different. So, <clears throat> in Japan, they're doing this, and um, there's a place to do and they, they have the green and red platform, and this man brought in a cup, when I, a bowl, and he said, the question he asked was, can you have a bowl of joy and inner peace on the green platform? They're so grounded, so founded, so rooted that it can contain any level of tragedy, tears or setbacks that come into your life. He left them with that for a week and the following week he came in and he put in a picture of Nelson Mandela. Here's a man who had tragedy, tears and setbacks yet never lost the inner peace, the joy, the happiness. And again it comes to that choice, the power to choose. And again, on the red platform, I blame you, I blame them. But with this one finger pointing at the three or four fingers pointing back at me. And the reality is that no matter how much I blame you, it will never change me. But on the green platform, it's I is the problem. I am responsible. I have responsibility. I have the ability to choose my response. Red platform, the ABC is the red platform, anger, blame, complain. Red, green platform, awareness, just awareness. And then belief and breaking limiting beliefs and commitment to do what I'll say I'll do long after the mood in which I've said it is over. Now, with awareness, I would just give a bit of just, the ego will agree with you being aware. It'll look back at all the negativity and see negativity, but the ego will want you to go judgmental. Make sure it's a compassionate awareness because we're changing centuries of conditioning here. It's just changing that, those centuries, because we never got a manual on Dunyaman. We got a manual for the washing machine. We got a manual for the computer. My father says, here's a manual for your mind. No. And it was all of that, you know, all of that, all those old scripts were handed down intact. But there was no manual to feel good or to be good in that sense. So it's making that change over. Now, a quick look here. We talk about changing the culture and the whole thing, Katrina, is changing the culture because, like, if I take up here, CEOs ask me, there are skills up there and we can have football skills, hurling skills, basketball skills, rugby skills. We can have management skills, leadership skills, presentation skills, sales skills, media skills, marketing skills, that's all skills up there. And a CEO said to me, how do I know if we get the course and you do the skills, the skills will last or they won't or they'll change? I said, look, I can do a course in a way that the skills would be used. You can pay me $3 million for a course. And I'll work on skills and I guarantee you they won't last. Because you can work on skills forever, but this is where you change a culture down here. And I've been privileged to work with a lot of teams over the years. The Down team with Paddy O'Rourke, the Kerry team with Jackie O'Connor, the Cork team with Conor Coonan, the Tipperary team with Liam Sheedy, and um, the Dublin hurlers with Anthony Daly and Richie Stakelham, the Kilmacud Crokes when they won the Ireland with Paddy Carr. But the change, there, it was down here the change took place. It was changing the culture. And it was making that change because unless you change the roots, you're not going to get the fruits. So if you have poison, red platform down here, forget about, no amount of skills are going to work up there. So again, it's about, this here is about the culture and this is about the skills. If you have a red platform culture, culture will need strategy and plans for breakfast 
And a red platform culture will sabotage your best plans, your best strategies. A green platform culture will exceed all the goals and will take you to a whole new level. So let's look at a red platform culture. Here's basically how we build a red platform culture. And this is language that I grew up with. You may not be familiar to you, but it's the everyday language of a losing team, of a red platform staff. I'm useless and the world's worse. Now, I am is hugely important because whatever comes after I am, I tend to become. I'm confident, I'm positive, I'm strong, I'm fit. Or I'm useless and the world's worst. So I'm useless and the world's worst. Things never work out for me. I'm a failure. I always ask poison questions and I always get poison answers. Why me? What else is going to go wrong? I'm overweight. I, uh, I doubt it. Every day is a struggle. I'll do it later. I just feel awful. I catch people doing things wrong and I don't have time to exercise. That's how you build a victim complaining staff or team on the trunk of blame. And down here, where you create the culture, you have poison ants. Poison automatic negative thoughts. And they're everywhere and they spread. And on that red platform, we have the energy vampires. You know these people, it's not the bad breath or their body odor, but my God, they're whinging, whining, moaning. They suck the energy from you. You meet them in the morning, good morning, what's good about it? They're determined to have a bad day and you're not going to change them. So that's the poison ants. So people are floundering. Now, in the States, the CEO said to me, oh, he said, this is all touchy-feely stuff. What about the bottom line? What about profits? What about the shareholders? The others? Profits? Shareholders said, you want the bottom line? I'll give you the, the, the results and profit. But he said, it must be genuine research. Okay, will you accept the Harvard Business Review? I will. Okay, page 62, Harvard Business Review, 2014, a Gallup poll on the cost of negative attitude, negative behavior, in other words, the red platform, cost the American economy the year before half a trillion dollars. If I have $1,000 bills in my hand, four inches high, I'm a millionaire, that's $1,000 bills in my hand, 38 miles high. That is the cost of the red platform. And 80% of the time in our minds we hang out there because we're conditioned. Oh, what are they going to ask you to do next? What else is going to go wrong? When you think they leave us alone. But if we switch to the, a, a green platform team, a positive team, I am confident. I really enjoy choosing my response. If it is to be, it's up to me. I can do it. I always ask poor questions and I always get poor answers. How can I, what can I, how can I turn this around and enjoy the process? How can I fuel every moment with the best that's in me now? I'm now fit and healthy. I fuel every moment with the best that's in me now. Every day and every way I'm getting better and better. I just do it now. I radiate joy. I catch people doing things right. And I love to exercise. That's how you build a green platform team on the trunk of responsibility and there's where you get real results. And down here you have healthy paths, positive automatic thoughts, and people are flourishing up here. And when they did studies in Harvard across a whole range of companies and organizations, when people were positive in the present, in other words, when they're on the green platform, productivity went up 31% and sales went up 37%. Every single business outcome improved and doctors were 19% better at correctly diagnosing ailments and illnesses. So that's the green platform because if you have poison roots, you're going to get rotten fruits. Bottom line, it's that simple. But if you have, again, if you have healthy roots, you're going to get phenomenal fruits. And all of that is a choice. And your best energy, your best time you give to work why not enjoy it? Why not make it fantastic? Why not make it phenomenal? And the people who are putting in, when I do this with secondary school staff, there's a secondary school staff down in Kerry and they've painted the door to the staff room green. Because only people, you come in on the green platform, you do not bring your red platform in here and start poisoning everybody else around you. And it's a, you know, and what I learned from, in the Philippines from like from Dennis Murphy, 
the judge was, you can't justify your negativity. I said, look, I buried 65 children. Nonsense. Victor Franklin was an Auschwitz. He made a choice every day. They killed 39 members of his family. He still made the choice. So that's the, that's the difference. And the roots will deliver the fruits. Now, the subconscious, it's um, the part, our conscious mind is up here, but the subconscious never sleeps. It controls 96% of the way we act and move and have our being. The subconscious is our unquestioning slave. It won't act for a good, it won't act for a bad. It's just activates the Nike ad, just do it. Now, to live on the green platform, we need to align the subconscious to work with us. And um, the subconscious is like a great big filing cabinet. It contains all our wisdom, all our intelligence, and it stores and runs all our programs of automatic behavior, like tying our shoes or driving the car. We don't have to relearn them every day. They're in there, programmed. So, again, it won't process negatives. It, it cannot separate what you vividly imagine from reality. If you imagine something vividly, imagination plus vividness equals reality for the subconscious. So that's why we can make all these changes by visualizing a different future. So this, this great, if I say, for instance, like, I don't want to be nervous. The thought comes in here, hits the, that website to my subconscious. My subconscious, my unquestioning slave, won't act for my good, won't, totally 100% obedient. And it responds with a Nike ad, just do it. I don't want to be nervous, just do it. Now it won't process not. So it gets the picture nervous. And it says, nervous, yeah, we can do nervous. So do a Google search through that filing cabinet, pick out the file nervous, and say, yeah, we get your knees shaking, get your voice rising, get the sweat come out and palm your hands. We've delivered, what do you want next? Now it doesn't know that we don't want to be nervous, but it always delivers. So if I rip off that label and say, I have to do this presentation, I feel very excited, then the subconscious will deliver excitement too. It will always deliver. So. If we look at an average day, how many thoughts we have in an average day? Studies done by Dr. Um, David McLean and Harvard University. On an average day, we have 50,000 thoughts. Now, it's irrelevant whether it's 50,000 or 50 million. But in terms of achieving our potential or going into self-fulfilling self-sabotage, what's hugely important is what percentage of those thoughts on an average day are negative. On an average day, 80% or 40,000 are negative. And it's asking, like asking the fish, fish, what's the water like? And the fish say, what water? We're so surrounded by negativity, we're not aware of it. Oh, it's not that easy. Don't the people I work with, tried it before, didn't work, too academic, too much paperwork, as anyone else ever tried it, I'd rather do it myself to be looking at, get yeah, any good at anything, can you do nothing right? Why is nothing ever easy? Just when we thought we're getting somewhere, no along comes this. You'll be the death of me, you'll drive me to an early grave. How could you be so stupid? Then we run out of negativity, we'll buy a newspaper. Oh my God, there's another feed of negativity. And we get all the negativity, all the negative stories. The heading on the news, television news yesterday evening was 362 million people in the EU went to work yesterday and came home. And they had incredibly good hot pots and lovely dinners with their children and watched nice box sets on the television last night. Is that your average evening, the first item on the news? But is it maybe somebody has stabbed? Somebody is killed, maybe there's a war. Maybe there's somebody else maybe told a little fib in the States or whatever it is. <laughs> but it's all of, all of that and we have to, like for three million years, the reptilian brain at the back here of our, has, it's a fight flight and it's filled with fear how to survive all of these things. We've long ago survived, we don't need it anymore, but we still, the fear is still there. So fear again is, is a deadly thing and we have to use our subconscious to get rid of it. So average day, 50,000 thoughts, 40,000 negative, 10,000 positive. Now we have to extend the positive ones and eliminate the 80% negative, 20% positive, 50,000 thoughts, 40,000 negative, 10,000 positive. Again, conscious mind, see, hear, touch, taste, smell. Choose, accept, reject, originate. But subconscious, it is our unquestioning slave. Whatever thought you put in. If you say, I feel tired, you're subconscious. Oh, we can do tired, we're good at that. 
you say, I need more energy, it'll do that too. So whatever you want, it'll deliver. Every thought is received as a command. And it's like that filing cabinet. It says, I, I don't want to feel nervous. It'll do a Google search, pick out that file nervous, and there you go. It has delivered again. It's like Aladdin's lamp, you know, and the, thing, you're every th the genie, your every thought is my command. The greatest poison in any family or any staff are the NBRs. The NBRs are the negative belittling remarks. And I spend a lot of time switching negatives to positives because you get the handed down negative scripts. In our tribe, we have a tradition and if something goes wrong, you know, there's a big catastrophe, whatever it is, and the elders will always say with their wise voices, oh, these things happen in threes. But something great happens. I've never once heard, oh, these things happen in threes. Well, the two other great things are going to happen. And even with the kids, you're switching, like, uh, how do you say, like, don't run across the road? Then they're gone. How do you switch that positive? Wait, hold daddy's hand, look left, look right. So I'm switching, and I was talking to Brian Darcy recently about, you know, the language we use, and we've grown up with it, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. How red platform can you get? Why not rejoicing and singing in this wonderful world? Does it give you a different feeling? So it's getting out of that. Now, negative belittle remarks, and then I said, okay, how do you change that? Positive, be bigging remarks. Have we even got the verb to be big? You know, or you, there you go, be bigging again. Ah, <laughs> you'll be bigger, yeah. You're not to be bigger. We don't be big people. We don't even have the language. Son, you're going to ask you a question, just answer yes or no. We ever ask this question like, what's right with you? What's right with you now? Were you ever asked that question in your life before? No, and 100% no people get. But once I ask the question, what's right with you? I open up a whole world of magic. But when I ask, have any ever heard this one? Or maybe it's just in County Cabin. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you now? Have you ever heard that? Now, once I say what's wrong with you, I do an excavation, I get, I get oh, that's only, you're only the surface, but they're much ro more rotten than that, and I dig, and I dig, and I dig. But if I say to Sonia, what's right with you, I see what's magnificent, and noble, and bright, and brilliant, and wonderful, and draw that out of her. And sometimes we have to see people's brilliance and draw it out of it before they even see it themselves. And it's getting that whole level of seeing what's right, and what's good, and what's positive in people. And the subconscious can kind of separate what's real from what is vividly imagined. Imagination plus vividness equals reality for the subconscious. Won't process negatives. Don't think of a white rabbit. Bang, white rabbit is there. So we have to throw that big self-talk switch. Now, here's the methodology, and there's about 10 PhDs crushed into a few slides here. So deep within the subconscious is the need to create and store order. What Fritz Perls would call Geshtot. And here's how it works. The subconscious will work 24-7 to restore order. So if I say I feel very nervous, it sees that as disorder, and so it works 24-7 to get order, to get you nervous. The minute you're nervous, it says, now we've got order again. It has no clue you don't want to be nervous. But if I rip off that label and say I feel very excited, then the subconscious will work 24-7 to get you excited and now it thinks it's got order again. So let's see how we can use the subconscious to help us achieve our goals. A goal must have a verb, a measure, and a date, or it's not a goal. To lose weight is not a goal. To lose, if I'm 16 stone, to lose two stone by December the 8th, that's a goal. Verb, measure, date. If I'm 200 pounds, to lose 10 pounds by December the 8th, that's a goal. So our goal, say, is to lose 10 pounds by December the 10th. I am now 200 pounds. What you do with your subconscious is you write a positive present tense sentence of your goal in its already achieved state, as if you've achieved it, because the subconscious doesn't know the difference. And once you put that, I now really enjoy winning 190 pounds, then the subconscious work 24 seven to put order on this disorder. And that's why future tense doesn't work with it or possibility. If you say I will be, it slides off the subconscious. Or possibility, I can be, slides off. So that one sentence, I now really enjoy weighing 190 pounds and 24 seven, because this works in reverse most of the time, because people say, I'm way overweight. And the subconscious gets that, way overweight, way overweight. 
you, there's a Mars bar. There's a, don't miss it. There's a Snickers bar. You've got, I will keep you way overweight. But if you put in, I now really enjoy having a fit and healthy body. You don't have it, but the subconscious will work on it. So that's 24-7. The subconscious will deliver 190 pounds. And that's how all the top athletes, the top performers in the world use that. It's that it's lying the subconscious. So let's look at it again. A verb measure the eighth. Let's say I'm 16 stone, I want to be 14 stone. To lose two stone by December the 8th, I now really enjoy weighing 14 stone. Then my subconscious will work 24-7 to make that happen. Then I put in subpower talk under it. I'm now really enjoying my run. I'm now really enjoying eating healthy food. I'm now really enjoying my swim. Again, with each one that I've not got it, it's as if you create the conflict, create the disorder, or first pairs we call the Gestalt. So what's missing in all of this is any negative self-talk. You totally focus. We think and we feel. You think and you feel only of what you want to create and attract into your life, not what you don't want to. <coughs> and the qualities then are, I am, I am confident, I am positive, I am strong, I am fit. Because whatever comes after I am, it's a receiver, it's a command by the subconscious. Present tense, because one to past or future. It must be positive what you want. You don't say, I'm not as big a slob as I used to be, because big a slob is what will go in. You don't say, I now really enjoy taking the stairs instead of the elevator. The elevator, the picture will go in. It must be brief, specific action words and emotionally charged. Like, work with the Kentucky Wildcats and the won the national title in 2012 and I would get them, you know, to use this power talk to eliminate the negative poison talk. So you say, okay, I'm confident, positive, strong and fit. I'm fast, flexible, agile and accurate. The bigger the day, the better we play. We're on the green platform all the way. Every day and every way I'm getting better and better. And then they go, I'm confident, positive, strong and fit. I'm fast, flexible, agile and accurate. The bigger. I said, guys, this is no use. You've got to put emotion, you've got to put energy into it. Come on. I said, are you pussy cats or wild cats? Then I ran. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, and then I had to get them, show them Ali. Did Ali say, I will be, I want to be after four or five fights. I might be as good as this out there like, like there was never a boxer in our family, you know. Or did he say, I am the greatest. A few years ago, I was introducing him here to a, a supper and I'd asked him, where do you get this I'm the greatest guy? And he said he got it from his grandmother. She said, if you keep saying I am the greatest, Maybe someday you'll believe it and others will believe it too. Now he, he said he's dead now, but be, at that time he said his mission is to help every man, woman and child in the world to be the greatest that they can be. But when he said it was not I am the greatest, it was I am the greatest. And I remember working here and doing some work with the Dublin Hurlers and just trying to get that energy into it. Like, and, and I play them back the, the clip from Ali. Did he say, I, I will show you how great I am? No. He said, I will show you how great I am. It was connected from here. And he got it and he nailed it and he did it. He made the change. So if we want real and lasting change in our lives, we change down here at the subconscious. We change it. I am confident. I'm so happy and grateful that, whatever. I now really enjoy having a fit and a healthy body. Doesn't matter whether you're happy or happy, you're on the way to do it. I radiate positive energy. I live each day with outrageous joy. Why outrageous? Because it's outrageous to live today in today's world with joy. Are you all right? You know, we cannot handle too much joy. You're not living in the real world. You know, to live with outrageous joy. I now catch people doing, doing something right and mention it to them immediately. I say, wonderful you, rather than shame on you. And then it's, every day and every way I'm getting better and better. And Again, the other image of the subconscious is an elephant. The conscious mind is the little ant up above the 4%. But normally the ant is going this way and the elephant is going the other way. So we have to align the two of them. And we have to train the elephant, the 96%. That's where we get the real change. How do you train the elephant? We train the elephant with visualization. The you you see is the you you'll be. So get that vision, get that image of you being the best that you can be. When I'll be doing presentation skills or that with people, I say, okay, can you stand up here? Can you see yourself delivering a presentation with energy, with enthusiasm, with excitement? So the you you see is the you you'll be. Power talk. I'm confident. I radiate joy. I'm strong and fit. Power questions. How can I, what can I? How can I be the best, best version of myself so that those around me can flourish and shine and be the best that they can be? 
How can it be the change I want to see in the whole pharma industry? How can it be the best that I can possibly be? How can I communicate to my staff that what they're doing has purpose and meaning? What they're doing is life changing. When I look at Alexander at home, he is living each day. I go up to the chemist, I get a box of Neocate Advanced, I mix it up, I feed it through him. The people who make the Neocate Advanced and the people who sell it have no idea they're keeping Alexander alive. Without Neocate Advanced, he's dead. That's purpose. Because that, people today no longer will work, work for jobs. They don't want jobs. People are hungry for purpose and meaning that they're making a difference in this world. And our job is to give them that purpose and give them that meaning. And I said to the man who runs the plan for the Make the Neo, Neo Kit, I would love to bring and give you a six foot picture of Alexander and to all your employers who come in, oh, terrible day, say, I am alive today because of your work here. And then all the other medications. 31 syringes a day. That's the difference. And that's powerful. So how can I, what can I? Clearly focus on what you want, see it, hear it, feel it, act as if. Then three clear figs. Three are three fiercely important goals. What are your three fiercely important goals? And then work towards making them happen and a positive self-image. Let's look at a red plat from Elephant. Visualize worst case, clearly see failure. Poison talk, I'm useless, I'm no good, I'm not enough. Poison questions, why me? What else is going to go wrong? What did I do to deserve this? Mental movie making, making catastrophization. Clearly focus on what you don't want, see it, hear it, feel it, act as if. And then goalless, reacting, drifting, no clear goal to give you energy and low self-image. The final image I give you of the subconscious is that of land. The farmer plants what he chooses. The land, your subconscious, doesn't care. But here's the weeds, success or failure, a clear goal of confusion. The land will return what is planted always 100% of the time. The land, your subconscious doesn't care, it will return what is planted. So plant only clear positive thoughts and goals. What you want, what you plant will return. So there's three images of the subconscious. So you think and you feel, only think and feel about what you want to create and attract into your life. And when you have somebody like Sally Gunnell, she said the great hurdles world champion and record breaker, she said, I taught myself not to have any negative thoughts. She didn't say it was natural in my family not to have any negative thoughts. I taught myself. And then uh, she said, before the World Championships in Stuttgart, she got a cold, got an infection, went into her chest, went to the doctor, gave her antibiotics. Then she was stifling a cough in the dressing room. And she said, I can't say I've got a cold. I'm going to have to go for it. So I kept feeding myself positive thoughts. I'm confident, I'm positive, I'm strong, I'm fit. And without she says, not only did I win the gold medal, but I broke the world record. And she said, I was freaked out to think I'd actually done it. I talked myself into winning. Same with the Williams sisters. They read out their power talk in between sets in Wimbledon. But I've covered most of it here, the key points, and uh, it's just a matter of leaving it. But now questions, Cecilia. I'm going to go back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's very good because when you come out from here today, you'll suddenly become aware of negativity. Levels of negativity you didn't even aware that you had. And you'd hear yourself coming out with negative stuff. And the ego on the red platform will take that awareness and instantly turn it judgmental. So it's to become aware of the negativity and let it go, just be compassionate. Because, as they say in Tibet, compassion that doesn't include you is not compassion. 
So it's been very com uh, because if judge if the awareness becomes judgmental, then the red platform is taken off again. And I'll give you an example. I um, years ago we took Ale Annette took Alexander over to um, to Graz in, in Austria to the best eating clinic in the world. All the other kids were eating after three weeks, but they didn't understand Mort Wilson syndrome. So he not only didn't eat, but he got dehydrated, then he got white coat phobia, he got needle phobia, and he got all kinds of separation anxiety. But he came back like a wave three weeks later, and then Annette was down in Cork doing some work with Apple, and I had three days coming up with a Takeda pharmaceutical company in, in Bray, and they were half Japanese, half Irish. And I needed to be at my best for energy, but it was 1.30 in the morning, he was at that stage in a, a, a crib at the bottom of the, uh, you know, what do you call the crib? The, not the crib, but you know, the cot, yeah, at the bottom of the bed. But about half past one, he woke up and he had the machine, and he looked over and he saw in a net shaped space where a net should be, and he started to scream and wail. And I brought him up in his machine and everything into the bed, and he started, you'd hear him the other side of Bray, screaming, screaming, screaming. Now, my self talk triggered in then I'll be wrecked tomorrow, I'll have no energy. He'll scream now until seven o'clock. This can't last. Sooner or later, this is going to kill us. We can't run a company like this. No amount of coffee is going to keep me awake tomorrow. And then I became aware, again, so that that's the ego. And the ego has kept me out of the present into 2 o'clock tomorrow. So I pulled back and I said, I'm going to be present here now. And I said, look, Alexander, I'll tell you what. Everyone else can eat except you. Everyone else can go to the toilet except you. Everyone else can, uh, can talk except you. And I said, everyone else can go around with all, the, all these multiple allergies. So I said, rage against the universe, God, Ra, Allah, Diwata, whatever force out there turns embryos into babies and seeds into plants and flowers and holds the galaxies together because I'm going to be here with you and going on. And I started to breathe and I was present with him and I took any other, anything other than the present moment in my mind. Five minutes later, he took a deep breath and he went fast asleep. Now, my process after that was my God, uh, like, that was pure ego. And I, I, I overcame the ego. But the minute I said that, the next thought was, and so you're supposed to be the green platform. That was an awful run of negative thoughts. Like, you know, you have to, you're making no progress at all. But the ego is back in judging me. Does that make sense? So be aware of the judgment of the ego. And that then you come aware again, and you let it go. And then the ego disappeared and I, I got back to sleep. But the other thing is that every mother will tell you this, the next day I was not tired. Because what tires us is the negativity. Negativity drains us. But mothers here know that, they can do that easily with children. And they open do a day's work. Just men, we get a little put out. But <laughs> that's it. Okay, any other, is that making sense? Yeah. Is that compassionate awareness? Anything else? Yeah, it's some people are extremely, I'd say two things. I know people who live on the green platform all the time. They don't seem to have to work at it, but they're welcoming the world. They're always in good humour. But I have to work at it every, and it, but some people get it very quickly. And then some people, it's a, it's a process. It's a journey. It's just, keep, but I wouldn't say I'm better than anyone else, but I keep saying I'm better than I was yesterday. I'm more aware than I was yesterday. And what I find is I use every opportunity to practice. Like last Tuesday week, I was in London, Ontario. I had to get a flight. I finished the course from it was a eight o'clock to one o'clock. They were in sandwiches and wraps. I said, no, I can't have them. I have to go to the airport. Got to the airport. I had to get a flight from London to Toronto. Then I had to go through immigration. So I asked them in London, will you put my bag through? It goes through Detroit and then Lexington to Lexington. And they were hearing me, ah, oh, do you have, ah, well, 
no, we can't. I said, of course you can. We do it all the time. You can put it through. Just put the bag through. You know, and she called over another lady and she was equally, oh, no, no, you'll have to take it off in Toronto because that was easier for them than putting it through or whatever it was. So I said, but it's all, and then, no, they put it through. So I had to, had a short, you know, a short turnaround. So I was back in the plane and then the pilot said, you know, oh, there's a 23 minute delay on this flight. And, uh, but we'll, please, you can still use your electronic devices for another while and we'll let you know that there's a lot of uh, traffic around Toronto. Got to Toronto, jumped off it, ran down, halfway to Ottawa, down corridor, baggage, 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 to find the carousel. Got the case of it, back up escalators, down and ran, run up, gate 19. <laughs> There's the bag. What's that? She says. I said that's my bag going to Lexington. They went, where are you coming? London, Ontario. Well, they should have checked it through to Lexington. I know. I told them, but they didn't. Now we have the bag here, so we have to get the bag through. Well, she said, look, the system is closed down. I can't do anything. You're going nowhere. I said, no, hold on a second. You're putting energy and thought and feeling into what we don't want. Let's think of what we do want. I said. <laughs> <laughs> so I said. Systems are made by human. We can overrun the system. The bag is going away. And then she called over this other lady then, a lady with red costume on her. And she was a big Amazon of a lady, big tall lady. And she went, you know, she said, systems closed down. You can't, you're going nowhere. I said, hold on, you use that word can't. Anytime you use can't, I'll break out in a rash. Because success comes in cans, not in cannons. So let's put our energy into thinking we're going to make this happen. She said, it's not going to happen. You're late. The system, the system shut down. I said, no, 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 no. I said, <laughs> I said wrong energy. Let's think what's possible. Let's start with the bag. We can get the bag. I know, I said, what you want to do. You want to create a great customer experience for this customer who is in a bit because you did nothing wrong. They did the wrong thing, but we can't blame on it. We can spend our time here blaming London, or we can make this. This is an opportunity to have a great customer experience. Let's say with the bag, we can get the bag out. She said, well, unless you bring it down and put it into the funnel yourself, it won't go. I said, well, you come down with it because I had the ticket down. In with the bag. She rubbed the ticket. It was a little flappy ticket that I got. And the, the inspector came around, a, a big uh, half American guy, and he says, well, you can't put that through, he says, because you have this ticket you got in. You have to print out a hard ticket, a hard cardboard ticket. But she said, the system's closed down, we can't do it. Well, he says, that's it. And she says, now, now do you get, she says, you're going nowhere. I said, no, no, the bag is going, we'll find a way. He said, the bag's going, because I said, if you think no, then uh, that's, it's just on everything. Look, she says, you're impossible. I said, no, I said, put in the post with there, I'm possible. I said, <laughs> so next thing I said to your man, look, creative, I know you have to have a little flicker, dicker, micker or something there. You flick this, that overrides it. Of course you have. And when it was no snot, he pulled out this thing, took, the bag's gone. Now she said, see what you've done. The bag is gone and you're here. You have to go through security and through immigration and you don't have time to make the plane. You're toast, she said. I said, no, still fresh bread. I said, <laughs> We're going, I'm going to make it. I said, that's wrong energy. We think and we feel. You're putting energy into what we don't want. Let's think and feel what we do want. And let's make this happen. What do you do? I said, I bend reality. Now, let's go. Ran down, off with the belt, off with the shoes, into, to, then down emigration, lane three, up in lane three. Then this phalanx of all these big machines up there. Put your passport in. Put the passport in. The screen came up. Reject, reject, reject. Call over the inspector. Look at this. He says, you're rejected, you're going nowhere, go back. No, I said, wrong energy, I'm not going back, I'm going. I says, this is only a little, the machine is having a bad day. I said, look, at, uh, I said, I'll try the other machine. And I said, be careful, don't say anything negative to the machine, it might tell the other machine. Over the other machine, put it in, everything came up, ran through. The guy, the thing, like, what do you do? I do management training, I do leadership training, I do making dreams reality, I bend in reality. Well, if you don't go quick, you're not going to make your flight. Ran down, and there's my big red Amazon. And she looked and she said, I don't believe this. This is impossible. I said, and she started telling the others, there was no way. He shouldn't have made it. He didn't want it. His bag is gone and he's, made it. he's the last passenger. He's on it. This should not have happened. And then she, she said, big high five. And then she said, come back. And the three or four others there, she says, come on, give me a kiss. I never liked to meet a man like you in my life again. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the first time I ever kissed the ticket agent and gone on to a plane. <laughs> but all I'm saying is that it's not, and then I was talking about that in Mankato and they were de de taken apart and I was saying, okay, but what if you didn't make it? I said, absolutely fine. My problem is not not making it. My problem is not making it without putting all the energy you have into making it. That's my problem. So I said, once you give everything 
and it's keep the energy in what you want. Keep your focus not on the problem to the solution. Keep switching the energy, switching the energy. Red platform, green platform. And every time she steps on the red platform, I bring her back on the green platform. Red platform, green platform. And we made it. So that's basically how it works. You practice every chance you get. You know, and um, it was another time, uh, like, uh, well, but I was very overweight because I had 40 books in it. And I said to them, I said, we're going to bend reality. The books went, it was fine. But, and, and it, all kinds of things like that keep happening. You know, that when you put your attention where you're going, focus on what you want. But the other thing was, there was no aggression. I didn't, I didn't give that low energy that she would give a vibrational match back. It was a bit of fun. It was, I know you want to create a great customer experience. You want to create something memorable. This is a huge opportunity for you. Like, you know, but the system is down. No, no, the system is relevant. We can make this. And, but it, then it happened. So is that, does that make sense? But it's been continually alert. And you'll, people just keep pulling the negative, just switch them over and keep switching. Yes. I have a question. So somebody said to me at the break, um, God, this is really interesting. And I'm sure yeah. you're going to bring this back to the role of yeah. PSPs yeah. or what we have to do. And I thought, oh God, maybe I should bring this back to what we do because I hadn't really thought that far. Yeah. All I really thought about was that thing that you very nicely said, the land will return what is planted. Yeah. And I suppose there wasn't a sense that we should do anything other than yeah. know this and mm. replicate it. But is there anything... You heard us talk earlier about the fact that the majority of the profession is yeah. very well and are on, on board. And there are some people who aren't. I don't think we can force them, but what would your advice be to us? Like, I think we'll all take something personally out of it. We'll take things back to family. Yeah. But for the Institute, what can we learn? How do we try to change the energy in the universe? Well, it's, it's like a, the vibration match. When you, get, when you have a whole room here of people who are on the positive the green platform, you see, the critical mass, I used to think, was 51%. No, if you look at all the molecules in an iron and how do you turn it into a magnet, it's 1%. You magnetize one, electrify 1% 1 and the rest all follow. Most of us are followers. We don't, we're, not, we're trained to be followers. We're domesticated, we're educated. We're not taught to be proactive to make life happen. We're, we're trained that life happens to us. So if we are proactive and going out there, even 1%, that will radiate, that will, tra that will, that will transfer, it will connect out. And you just fo keep following the formula, and the formula is acceptance plus positive action, and the whole universe will conspire with you. And I was doing a course with some left brain accountants on the right-hand side of the Liffey a few months ago, and one of them said to me afterwards, says, I can get the acceptance, I can get the positive action now, but I sure don't get this whole universe is conspiring with you. Could you give me an example of that or how it works or a story? Look, I give you one story, ten stories, because that's how life works. I said, you're in a corridor down here. You don't move, nothing happens. You move down that corridor, the right doors start to open. When you move, Providence moves too. But give me a story. Okay, I'm in San Francisco. I get a note from Annette. Two years ago, the HSE have taken away Alexander's medical card. We're on our own now. This is a disaster. Came home, sat down, and I'm saying, okay, what do we need to do to get this medical card back? Is it a disaster or is it an opportunity to get medical cards back for all the terminally ill children? So I'm sitting there and say, okay, acceptance, the card's gone. Plus positive action now. What, of the hundred things, one positive thing can I do? I remember Ness saying to me, do you think you, one individual, you're going to change the HSE and the government's mind? I said, I have a formula. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody binged somebody on Facebook and wasn't to go to Facebook. So I put up a picture of Alexandra and a story on Facebook. Now Genevieve, her daughter at the time, has a PhD in Facebook. Well, she's put the time into it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she came and I showed it to her as the expert. And she said, Dad, if you put up like this, only you and your four friends, if you have four friends, will see it. But if you press this lobby thing, other people see it. Press the lobby thing. The next day, that evening, a journalist rang me up. We had two pages spread in the national newspaper the next day. Saturday got a call from the Saturday night show because I'd been on promoting the Green Platform. And uh, they said, we heard about Alexander, we'll give you 30 minutes tonight on the Saturday night show. Did the Saturday, brought in two suitcases full of syringes and materials that would last in one week and did the Saturday night show. The next day there was 30,000 views in the story on the journal.ie. Monday the Independent had it. Tuesday, Michael Martin 
uh, spent five minutes in the Dáil asking Enda Kenny why he took away Alexander's medical card. Did you see all those stringes and the two suitcases full on the Saturday night show? All the newspapers had it the next, next day. Then we were lucky the European elections were going on. So when Enda Kenny was the last leader to be interviewed, the first question Brian Dobson asked him in the 6-1 News was, how about the economy? And second question, what were you thinking of when you took Alexander's medical card away? In the 42 days of the campaign, we got all the other terminally ill children's parents did phenomenal work outside the doll with banners and everything. But at the end of the campaign, the Minister for Health had to resign, the Minister for Education had to resign, the head of the Labour Party had to resign, and all the terminally ill children got their medical cards back. And um, again, we could not have planned or organised that campaign. But when you move down that corridor, acceptance plus positive action and the whole universe will conspire with you. As you know, but if you sit there and do nothing and complain, poor me, nothing happens. And one man said, I thought I understood the green platform the first night you were on the Saturday night show. But he said, trust me until the second night that I really understood what it is when you stand up. Because the green platform is not going out to the garden, seeing all the weeds and saying, oh, there are no weeds, it must be on the green platform, all is well, well, well. No, it means get a plan for the garden, roll up your sleeves, pull the weeds. <coughs> it's not driving down the road and see a fuel gauge at E and say, Oh, I must be positive my few, I'd get a smiley face sticker and put it on, a nice green sticker. Uh, everything is well, well, well. No, that's <coughs> denial. You get your car to a garage. And he says to me then, he says, oh, you were lucky, give me another story. I said, okay, I give you stories, that's how life works, I said. When I came back from the Philippines, so we, we raised, set up the Philippines Human Development Fund, we raised hundreds of thousands for projects out in the Philippines. And just three weeks ago, we were able to send out 15,000 to Father Sheikh Cullen, who has a centre where he takes the kids out of the brothels and the jails and we look after the feeding and the education of them. But I was raising all kinds of funds and I wanted to, there was a hundred runners going to run from San Francisco into New York and I needed an aeroplane. So the bus drivers used to give me free transport, done, but one of the bus drivers, Dermot Hakeen, said, I said, who has an aeroplane? I want to get an aeroplane for free. So he said, there's a man who has aeroplane. So I went into the coin box, put in the coins, rang up. The PA, well, must have been having a bad day because she put me through. And I'm talking to this man called Tony Ryan. And I said, I want a 747 and pilots and fuel to fly to San Francisco with 100 runners, drop them off, then fly back empty to New York. They're going to run across the States into the Patrick's Day Parade and then we'll wait, wait for a few days when we'll you have the crack and then back to Ireland. I want the plane and the pilots and fuel for free. He says, he was confrontational from the beginning. He says, if you have only 100 runners for crying out loud, you don't need a 747 or 72, something will do you. I said, okay, but Tony, if I bust all the people with me, can I have the plane, I'm in a hurry. He says, yes, come down to Guinness Peter Aviation next Monday, house in Ennis next Monday at 12 o'clock, we'll discuss the details. I drive down. He's still confident. He says, have you talked to the people in New York about the parade? And he said, I said, no. Well, he says, well, you go over next Monday and talk. These are the key people you need to talk to. And he said, don't you, hold a second. Go over next year to New York. I barely had no petrol put in the car come down and see you. How am I going to go to New York? I'll be returning a ticket for you in the customer care desk in Erlingus next Monday. He says, is there anything else you haven't told me? Yeah, I want Jimmy Carter to run a bit in the middle because he's beginning to run in. And Ted Kenny has a bad back, so I won't ask him to run, but he can walk the last half mile. Have you talked to Ted Kenny? Of course you haven't. Here's his number of his secretary in Congress, and forget what Jimmy Carter, you're not going to get through to the White House. But here's his mother's number in Alabama, and she'll talk to him. Walking out, I said, Tony, why did you give me the plane? So that's very simple. Anyone, somebody, ring, somebody rings me up from a coin box in Dublin, says they're in a hurry, they want a plane and pilots and fuel to fly to San Francisco, drop off 100 runners, and while they run 30 miles each across the United States, and then fly back into New York, wait for a few days where they have a crack, and then fly back to Ireland with them. It's just that's never likely to happen to me in my life again. That person gets the plane. So that was Tony Ryan. But that's, the point is, it's not the stories that, that's acceptance, positive action, and the whole universe will conspire with you. But sit on your hands, do nothing, blame, complain. You're tying Providence hands behind his back. It cannot work with you. But when you move, Providence moves too. And that's where all the magic happens. And I love the thing you said at the beginning, Katrina. We didn't know where the journey was. You don't have to know. I just knew what, I'm going to Lexington. I didn't know how. You create, you invent the how, and you have fun doing it. And you enjoy the journey. You don't miss the gorge. And you get there, and you create, and you invent, and you create, and you, invent, and you self correct, and you self correct. But you must start on the journey. And you bring joy every bit of the journey. And when you have a vortex of people like your river going down on that journey, that energy is going to spread and spread and spread. If that makes sense. Okay.
Well, if I may, I'd like to say thank mm -hmm. you very much, Declan, and if we can uh, show our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope that you found that um, thought-provoking and that you can bring it from here to use in whatever way uh, you decide. But I do think stopping and considering which platform are we on is a really important thing to do in the first instance, that self-awareness, and then taking our choice in, in the moment as to which we use. And you notice I said earlier, I think the, the colour in the Institute is apt for us to be the green platform of the profession. Uh, and that's what I feel when I'm with you every time as peer supports and with indeed the wider profession. So that's my dream for the Institute. And thank you yeah. very much for sharing uh, your insights and thoughts with us. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Catherine.